Muy buenos días. Oh. Eh, muy buenos días a todos y todas. Eh, un saludo respetuoso y muy fraterno para los peticionarios de esta, de esta audiencia, las organizaciones que hoy nos acompañan y eh, al ilustre Estado de Canadá por su presencia y participación. Como ustedes saben, las, ambas partes, esta es una audiencia que la Comisión Interamericana eh, convocó de oficio precisamente para poder eh, tener eh, una comunicación directa, con información directa por parte de, de ustedes. Y el tema eh, que nos convoca es precisamente evaluar la situación de las mujeres, niñas y adolescentes que eh, eh, tienen una situación de eh, violencia, de muerte y de desaparición en el Estado de Canadá. Eh, agradecemos a los presentes por su asistencia a este acto. Nos acompañan en la mesa, bueno, como quien dice, la fuerza de las mujeres en la Comisión Interamericana. <ríe> Hoy la comisionada Antonia Urrejola como segunda vicepresidenta, la comisionada Margaret May McCollett como relatora para los derechos de la mujer, la comisionada Antonia, relatora para el tema indígena, y la comisionada Flavia Piovesan, también a cargo de relatorías eh, de, relatoría de país. ¿no? Así que estamos, como quien dice, la fuerza completa de la comisión. <ríe> eh, con, con muchísimo gusto vamos a darle la palabra, en primer lugar, a la representación de la sociedad civil, van a tener 15 minutos, en este 15 minutos ustedes lo pueden distribuir en el tiempo con la participación de quienes ustedes estimen para hacer uso de la palabra, eh, luego le vamos a dar al Estado 15 minutos también y a las comisionadas eh, 15 minutos también, <ríe> para tenernos marcado un tanto el, el tiempo. Eh, si tienen a bien presentarse cuando hacen uso de la palabra para el registro de su participación. Muchísimas gracias y damos inicio inmediatamente con la palabra a el, la sociedad civil. Good morning. My name is Sharon McIver. I'm a Thompson Indian and member of the Lower Nicola Indian Band from Merritt, British Columbia, Canada. I'm here representing the Canadian Feminist Alliance for International Action, or FAFIA, with my colleague Sheila Day, the chair of FAFIA's Human Rights Committee. I'm also the litigant and petitioner to the UN Human Rights Committee in the case of McIver v. Canada. Uh, challenges to the sex discrimination in the Indian Act. In January 2019, the UN Committee finally ruled that the continuing sex discrimination in the Indian Act violates the rights of First Nations women to equal protection of the law and equal enjoyment of culture. In response, on August the 15th, 2019, the Government of Canada eliminated pre-1985 sex discrimination from the Indian Act. As a result, up to 450,000 First Nation women and their descendants are newly entitled uh, to Indian status. In law, the sex discrimination against First Nations women and the matrilineal line of descent with respect to status and transmission of status that existed from 1876 to 2019 is gone. We were invited here today to update you on the missing and murdered Indigenous women, um, but Indian Act sex discrimination is related to the issue because uh, ICAR, the CEDAW Committee, and Canada's National Inquiry all found that it is, it is the root cause of the violence. 
Fafia has appeared before this commission in 2012, 2013, 2016, 2017 on the subject of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. In 2013, at our request, the commissioners came to Canada to investigate and uh, the Inter-America Commission issued its report in December of 2014. This was the first official report and it was groundbreaking. It focused domestic and global attention on the human rights of indigenous women and girls and addressed the murders and disappearances as violation of their rights. The National Enquiry in its final report issued on June 3, 2019 found that the Canadian state has historically engaged in and maintains today a significant, persistent, and deliberate pattern of systemic racial and gendered human rights and indigenous rights violations. This is the cause of the disappearances and murders and violence, and it is part of a slow-moving, decades-long genocide practiced against indigenous people. Because the roots of the violence are historic, historical and deeply embedded in institutional policies and practices, massive change is required. Uh, the Inter-America Commission, the CEDAW Committee, and the National Inquiry have all called for a national action plan because government, federal, provincial, and territorial need to act in a coordinated way to end the violence. Prime Minister Trudeau has agreed to develop and implement a, implement a national action plan, but an election has been called and Canadian voters will decide who will lead the next government on October the 21st, 2019. National Inquiry, the Inter-America Commission, and the CEDAW Committee agreed that the national, national action plan must do these things. Address the distinct realities and cultures of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit women. Be coordinated among federal, provincial, and territorial governments and have nationwide goals, timetables, measures, programs, and resources. Be supported by the use of federal spending power uh, to incentivize action by provincial and territorial governments. Have infrastructure that ensures that Indigenous women are centrally engaged in design and implementation of the strategies. Have infrastructure and process that provides independent and public oversight of steps taken. The key components of a national action plan must address the social and economic disadvantage of Indigenous women and girls, child welfare systems in all jurisdictions, police violence and failure to protect Indigenous women and girls, bias in the justice system, over-criminalization and incarceration, lack of adequate service including legal aid and shelters, support for families including support for reopening cold cases and prosecutions, resources for Indigenous women and their organizations so they can participate in the transformation of institutional practices and policies. And reparation and reform are now the key issues for Canada and for Indigenous women and girls. We seek the assistance of the Commission in this next stage, in particular in designing and implementing the best reparations and reform models for the current situation in Canada, so that Canada delivers appropriate remedies, fundamental institutional change, and long-term accountability. We hope this is a preliminary dialogue and we can examine how to develop methods for working on a sustained basis with the Inter-America Commission. As, as a beginning, we ask for a working visit to Canada by commissioners so that we can engage with more Indigenous women and Canadian officials in a collaborative and planned work. Thank you. Hi, my name is Pam Palmiter. I'm a registered Indian and member of Eel River Bar First Nation, uh, part of the Sovereign Mi'kmaq Nation. I've also been a practicing lawyer for 20 years. I'm here today to speak uh, as a subject matter expert on the issue of genocide in Canada, specifically the abuse, exploitation, violence, disappearances, and murders of Indigenous women and girls. 
the National Inquiry into Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women and Girls found ample evidence and a manifest pattern of similar conduct to find Canada guilty of genocide that is both race-based and specifically targets Indigenous women. This finding was not an academic one. It was based on independent legal analysis and extensive evidence. There is no utility or need to reinvestigate this finding. What we need now is for international human rights bodies like yourselves to help Canada transition to a place without genocide. As you know, genocide can be um, done in one of five different ways and Canada has been found to be guilty of all five. The National Inquiry specifically found that both pre- and post-colonial settler governments have created, maintained, and reinforced an infrastructure of violence towards Indigenous women and girls. And this infrastructure of violence is a complex set of institutional laws, policies, practices, actions, and omissions which knowingly treats Indigenous women and girls as lesser human beings who are sexualized, racialized, and treated as disposable because of their sex and race. Although Canada supported the National Inquiry, all governments and state agencies are still active perpetrators and perpetuators of genocidal violence against Indigenous women and girls. This requires urgent, immediate, comprehensive, substantial national action in order to end the genocide and the deaths of Indigenous women. I support Fafia's request, seeking your intervention and assistance in working with both Canadian officials and Indigenous women to oversee a transitional justice plan that would be national in scope, apply to all levels of government and agencies that focuses on first ending the genocide, reparations for harms done, prevention of future genocide, and to us, any plan moving forward must have at its basis a human rights framework and gender analysis for every stage of the plan. So we support both a working visit to start and assistance with that plan going forward. Thank you. Yeah, Louise Lorraine Whitman. I'm a Mi'kmaq woman from Mi'kmaq in Nova Scotia. Uh, territory. I'm also the president of Native Women Association of Canada. We are the largest Indigenous women's group in Canada in which we have our women on office in each province and territory. We represent and defend social, economic, social, uh, cultural, and political rights of grassroots women, girls, gender diverse, since 1974. In 2017, after years of reports from families and human rights activists, the Government of Canada finally launched the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. June 2019, a 1,200-page inquiry report was handed down. The report documents human rights violations, including the discrimination in the Indian Act, residential schools, day schools, 60 scoop, and this is taking the children from their home and placing them in other homes or in childcare. Forced sterilization and over-incarceration. The inquiry report also sets out 231 calls of justice for all governments, industries, institutions, services, and all Canadians. The key conclusion of the National Inquiry is that a genocide took place in Canada. It spanned decades over gradual and in nature. It has been over three months since the release of the National Inquiry's final report, and we were expecting more concrete actions and commitments from the government in response from the expert report. The families are waiting to see action and justice. In the past few months, we have turned to international human rights bodies and advocacy, express our concern and seek support for the implementation of calls for justice. Our presence here today is before you is a continual of the work to raise 
awareness of the ongoing violence against indigenous women. It is a national inquiry's view and our view that the definition of colonial genocide needs to be recognized as it exists in Canada and other countries. The time is now for the international community to view the crime of genocide in this wider perspective and to expand the current understanding of this crime. The American Doc Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, Article 10 states, the Indigenous Peoples have the right to not be subjected to any form of genocide. We believe the findings of genocide in the inquiry report correctly triggered organizations of American states to act and appoint an expert body to Canada. We welcome the decision as it will endure appropriate implementation of the calls for justice. We are grateful for your support it is crucial that international pressure be brought to bear on Canada. This means ensuring there is specific follow-up to the calls for justice, which are legal obligations and not just recommendations by the National Inquiry. Well, Anne, thank you. Vamos a escuchar un, un, ¿sí? Por favor, la palabra para ustedes. Mesdames les commissaires, les commissaires euh, Coué, euh, c'est M. Koumet Nord, Mac, tu m'as mené à ton tête, mais tu es pas tes mots. Je m'appelle Viviane Michel, je suis la présidente de Femmes autochtones du Québec. Femmes autochtones du Québec est une organisation bilingue, sans but lucratif et non partisane depuis 1974. Nous militons pour la défense et promouvoir le droit des femmes autochtones des dix nations au Québec et du milieu urbain. Soutenu par une structure organisationnelle solide et vaste expérience, notre organisme bien, est bien connu aujourd'hui pour sa participation active à tous les domaines touchant la vie auto des femmes autochtones. La lutte contre la discrimination et la violence envers les femmes autochtones est au cœur de notre travail depuis notre fondation. Depuis 45 ans, notre organisation travaille à la fois sur le terrain auprès des femmes autochtones et face aux acteurs gouvernementaux sur les scènes locales, provinciales et fédérales, ainsi qu'à l'international. Nous avons d'ailleurs euh, été parmi les premières organisations à prendre la rue pour demander au Canada d'enquêter sur les, le taux alarmant des femmes et des filles autochtones disparues et assassinées, bien avant que les chefs, et principalement des hommes évidemment, ne prennent cette crise au sérieux. Nous avons démontré en réalisant la première étude spécifique au Québec sur les femmes autochtones disparues et assassinées que cet enjeu ne concernait pas seulement les provinces de l'Ouest canadien, comme le voulait la croyance populaire dans notre pays. Nous avons aussi été au premier plan pour soutenir les femmes autochtones de Val-d'Or au Québec qui ont dénoncé publiquement les abus et les violences dont elles étaient victimes de la part des policiers. Bref, nous connaissons la réalité des femmes que nous représentons. Nous les écoutons activement et les incluons. Et nous œuvrons à tous les jours pour assurer une meilleure protection de leurs droits. Comme vous le savez maintenant, l'enquête nationale sur les femmes et les filles autochtones assassinées et disparues a conclu que la crise qui nous afflige aujourd'hui trouve sa source, sa source dans le processus de colonisation de nature génocidaire qui est encore aujourd'hui bien vivant dans les structures étatiques du Canada. Notre identité de femme et d'Autochtone nous vulnérabilise face à une société patriarcale et raciste qui accorde moins de valeur à nos vies et à un système de justice discriminatoire qui ne nous protège pas. Il y a urgence d'agir pour protéger les droits de la vie, à la sécurité et à la dignité de toutes les femmes autochtones à travers le pays. Depuis le début de la colonisation, le Canada a cherché à priver les femmes autochtones de leur rôle traditionnel en matière de gouvernance et de leadership. Nous avons été marginalisés par les stéréotypes de genre et des structures patriarcales qui ne correspondent pas à nos traditions. Il est grand temps de réclamer nos rôles et notre place au sein de nos nations et de la société dans son ensemble, ce qui d'ailleurs est au cœur de la mission de la femme autochtone du Québec depuis, depuis nos débuts. La première recommandation de l'enquête nationale la plus urgente à notre avis est l'élaboration d'un plan d'action national par tous les paliers gouvernements en partenariat avec les peuples autochtones. 
Ce sur quoi je tiens à insister aujourd'hui est sur l'importance que les femmes autochtones, particulièrement les organismes par et pour les femmes autochtones comme nous, qui incluons les familles et qui sont euh, directement en connexion avec les familles, jouent un rôle de leadership clair dans l'élaboration de ce plan d'action et dans la mise en œuvre des stratégies identifiées. Pour que ceci soit possible, il est essentiel que le Canada nous accorde les infrastructures, les ressources et le financement nécessaires pour jouer ce rôle. Il n'y a aucun doute, nous sommes les mieux placés pour conseiller les gouvernements dans l'élaboration d'un plan d'action national sur la mise en œuvre du rapport de l'INFADA. Nous comprenons les enjeux auxquels font face nos membres et nous connaissons le travail qu'il y a à faire. Nous avons à cœur d'assurer l'avènement d'un système de justice qui traite les femmes autochtones de façon équitable, culturellement appropriée et qui respecte les obligations du Canada en matière de droits humains. Notre expertise doit être reconnue et les meilleures conditions possibles doivent être mises en place pour assurer notre rôle actif tout au long de ce processus et à chacune des étapes de la mise en œuvre. L'égalité et la sécurité ne seront possibles que si trois conditions sont réunies. Premièrement, si le gouvernement démontre une volonté réelle de mettre en œuvre les recommandations de l'ENFADA. Ensuite, s'il s'appuie sur l'expertise, le travail et les recommandations des organisations régionales des femmes autochtones. Et finalement, si un échéancier clair et du financement approprié sont garantis, afin d'assurer le suivi exemplaire de la mise en œuvre des recommandations. Le Canada doit être tenu responsable de ses manquements envers les femmes autochtones et être contraint à mettre fin aux injustices que subsistent. L'apport de votre commission est précieux afin d'appuyer ses objectifs et de mettre fin à la violation de nos droits humains par le Canada. Jusqu'à maintenant. Bueno, eh, ya tenemos el tiempo... Eh, excedido, van a tener el Estado tres minutos más del de tiempo eh, para eh, darle luego en la intervención eh, segunda, podrán entonces hacer uso de la palabra, creo que la compañera eh, no, no pudo y estaba preparada para ello, eh, les pido disculpas por eso, pero en, en la segunda vuelta eh, creo que es, es, es posible, ¿verdad?, Está, ¿Estaría bien? ¿Sí? Bien. Entonces, le vamos a dar la palabra a el ilustre Estado de Canadá. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning to everyone. My name is François Jubinville, and I'm the, I'm the chargé d'affaires of the Permanent Mission of Canada to the, to the Organization of American States. I am pleased to be here representing the Government of Canada today, and I am joined by my colleague, Heidi Sanchez, who is the senior officer responsible for gender issues in our team. Uh, Canada would like to thank the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights for the opportunity to participate in this hearing on murder and missing and murdered indigen indigenous women and girls. Canada welcomes the Commission's long-standing interest, has, as, it, as it's already been pointed out, uh, and ongoing engagement with Canada on this important issue. I'd also I'd like to thank um, Sheila Day and Sharon McIver of the Canadian Feminist Alliance for International Action, Professor Pamela Palmater of Ryerson University, Madame Viviane Michel, des Femmes Autochtones du Québec, um, and Ms. Lorraine Whitman of the Nation, Native Women's Association of Canada, as well as Mr. Jeremy Watson, Matson, sorry, for their presence here today. Your continued advocacy related to the rights of Indigenous people in Canada is of crucial importance. Canada recognizes the important work that Indigenous women's organizations and other advocacy organizations have done and continue to do in order to demonstrate the significant risk of violence experienced by Indigenous women and girls. We also recognize the tremendous strength and courage of the survivors and family members of missing and murdered Indigenous, indigenous women and girls in sharing their experiences with the National Inquiry. Before I address the issue that brings us here today, allow me to underscore Canada's current political context and what it means for the Government of Canada's participation in this hearing. On September 11th, a federal election was called in Canada and by convention, the incumbent government as well as the federal public service are expected to act with restraint during an election period. Both must confine themselves 
to necessary public business and avoid binding future governments to the extent possible. This is known as the Con Caretaker Convention. Given the restrictions of the convention, I will focus my comments here today on the actions the government has taken before September 11th and the commitments it has already made. Should there be any questions following my intervention, I will take good note of them on behalf of the Government of Canada, Canada and will not be in a position to respond. Thank you in advance for your understanding. Rest assured that it remains important for the, for the Government of Canada that it be represented here today in order to reiterate its commitment to achieving reconciliation with Indigenous, indigenous peoples in Canada. Now, please allow me to provide you with some background and information on the National Inquiry and its mandate. In September 2016, the Government of Canada launched an independent National Inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. This key commitment initiative sought recommendations with respect to concrete actions we could take in relation to this national tragedy. The inquiry was launched in order to take steps to address the systemic causes of all forms of violence that Indigenous women and girls experience, as well as their greater vulnerability to that violence. This government initiative led to the release of an interim report in November 2017, and a final report on June 3, 2019. The National Inquiry concluded its operations a few weeks later on June 30th. It's important to note that between September 2016 and December 2018, the inquiry conducted an in-depth study analysis of the issues. Its work involved collecting information through collaboration and community and institutional hearings using various sources, such as past and current research, forensic analysis of police records, and over 1,400 testimonies, including those of survivors of violence, families of victims, subject matter experts, and elders and knowledge keepers. In November 2017, the inquiry released an interim report to outline progress to date, challenges, and interim recommendations. A family-first approach was used, recognizing the significant strength and courage of the family members of missing or murdered Indigenous women and girls who contributed, contributed to the inquiry. A number of steps announced in June 2018 have been taken to address early recommendation, recommendations from the inquiry's interim report. Such steps announced in June 2018 include an allocation of $50 million in funding in order to collaborate with Indigenous communities. More specifically, this previously announced funding aims to provide health and healing support services to survivors and their families, to conduct a review of police policies and practices regarding relations with Indigenous peoples, to establish a national investigative oversight body at the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, to support victims' families' access to information, and to commemorate the lives and legacies of victims. In addition, Canada's 2016, 2017, and 2018 budget exercises dedicated funding to support the implementation of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis housing strategies, such as building five new on-reserve shelters for victims of domestic violence, providing core funding to the National Aboriginal Circle Against Family Violence, and allocating $1.7 billion over 10 years to support housing on reserves as part of a 10-year First Nation housing strategy. Housing in Nunavut, an Inuit-led housing plan in the Inuit regions of Nunavik, Nunatsiavut, and Inuvialuit, and the Métis Nations housing strategy. Investments have also been made to support women's shelters, housing, education, reform of, of child welfare, and safety improvements along Highway 16, the Highway of Tears between Prince George and Prince Rupert in British Columbia. At the closing ceremony of the National Inquiry on June 3rd of 2019, the Government of Canada accepted the inquiry's final report, entitled Reclaiming Power and Place, and respects its findings. The government thanked all those who played a role in the inquiry, namely the Chief Commissioner and Commissioners, Grandmothers, the National Family Advisory Circle, and all of their staff for their work and dedication. 
thanks were also extended to the First Nations, Inuit and Métis families and survivors, knowledge keepers and experts, all of whom participated in the inquiry hearings and courageously told their stories. The inquiry's final report including call, included calls for justice under four themes, culture, health and wellness, human security and safety, and justice. And these calls for justice were aimed at all orders of government, institutions, social services providers, industry, and Canadians. At the closing ceremony, the government also acknowledged that the report was the result of the work of many individuals and organizations who had advocated tirelessly for Indigenous women and girls and Indigenous LGBTQ and Two-Spirit people. Canada acknowledged that facing the hardest truth is a necessary step to addressing those truths and to moving forward together. In addition, the government is committed to conducting a thorough review of the inquiry's final report and to developing a national action plan to address violence, violence against Indigenous women, girls, and LGBTQ and Two-Spirit people. The Government of Canada also committed to continuing to work in partnership with Indigenous partners and to include the perspectives and full participation of Indigenous women and girls as well as the voices of LGBTQ and Two-Spirit people, family members of victims and survivors of violence. Canada remains committed to addressing the systemic causes of violence against Indigenous women and girls and to increasing the safety and security of all Indigenous women, girls and Indigenous LGBTQ and Two-Spirit people across the country. Reducing the rates of violence against Indigenous women and girls and Indigenous LGBTQ and Two-Spirit people is key, and thus, the government committed to translate the inquiry's calls for justice into real and meaningful action. All orders of, gov of government in Canada have a role in protecting Indigenous women and girls against violence. The National Inquiry was not just a federal inquiry. It took place simultaneously in every federal, provincial, and territorial jurisdiction in Canada. As such, the federal government has also committed to continuing to work with provinces and territories to encourage cooperation across all order orders of government in responding to this report. The federal, provincial, and territorial governments have committed to reviewing its recommendations to determine next steps and future actions within their respective jurisdictions. Furthermore, in July 2019, the heads of government of each province and territory acknowledge the important work undertaken through the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous, Indigenous Women and Girls. A coordinated and inclusive approach with all Canadians is required to turn the inquiry's calls for justice into real, meaningful Indigenous-led action. Canada takes the issue of violence against Indigenous women and girls very seriously, and notwithstanding the restrictions of the caretaker period, the government's review of the inquiry's final report and its recommendations remains ongoing, as does the vital work of our partners. Some of the work that Canada has already undertaken responds to these recommendations. For example, in August of this year, Canada proceeded with the final removal of all remaining sex-based inequities from Indian Act registration provisions going back 150 years. As we have done in the past, Canada will continue to engage with the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights regarding Indigenous issues and other pressing human rights challenges. We value the Commission's independence and important work on the promotion and protection of human rights in the hemisphere. Canada is committed to defending a strong rules-based international order and welcomes the international com communities ongoing participation and advancing the rights of indigenous peoples around the world. Rest assured that the concerns of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights as well as those of all of the interveners participating in today's hearing are being duly noted. Thank you again for offering Canada the opportunity to participate in this important hearing today. Thank you. Muy bien, eh, creo que vamos a tener unos minutos más extra para la sociedad civil. Eh, solo ocuparon 12 minutos de los 15. Eh, el procedimiento a seguir ahora es darle la palabra a eh, las comisionadas y voy a empezar con la comisionada Margaret May McCauley en su condición 
de relatora para, ¿no? para, para la relatoría de eh, mujeres y eh, centrando pues en la, la, la temática. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone, and um, thank you for the, your presentations this morning on this very important issue. I am um, constrained, and I must mention the fact that I personally, and the Commission, I'm sure, will join me in thanking Ambassador Jennifer Lawton for all the work she did, especially with my rapporteurship and other rapporteurships, including the President's one. She um, uh, uh, was a real firm and strong spirit in enabling us to have money for the women's rapporteurship and the children's rapporteurship to engage in a project in many countries in the region. And um, over the years, I have to say that sometimes I, I used to nag her a great deal about the Indian Act the provision and asking why cannot Canada remove that discriminatory provision? They have amended the act so often over the years, but they always shy away from that. And um, she did say, they're sure that Canada will come to it. I said, but when? You know, and now I am happy to, to see that it has happened. Um, a bit late, but it's happened. And. Um, it is unfortunate that we all have in Canada the caretaker convention um, because our hands are really constrained until, when are the elections going to be? October, October 21st. Well, we certainly will be watching avidly. And um, since the state is, a, is the, the body which has the obligation to continue the work which has been done in this national um, inquiry through whatever government is in power following the elections, we certainly will be pursuing the matter very, very strongly. And I am happy you mentioned the, the subject of a, a, a visit um, to Canada, working visit, because we had been um, discussing this with um, Ambassador uh, Lawton when she was in office. And um, unfortunately, we could not get to the point of going. But perhaps this is the best time to go after the elections um, so that we can ensure that we um, um, do work together with all the various agencies and the representatives of um, the um, indigenous peoples across the board in Canada to ensure your participation, full participation at every level of a national plan which is put in place with our assistance and input. And so we look for, I'll certainly look forward to that and, and we will do our best in whatever way for your great country of Canada to at last come to this which it should have done for so long. And, and um, perhaps the mounted police can reclaim their position of respect, which is rather tainted. Uh, um, but it's a good thing. It's, it's a very good thing. And I, I thank the government that it did set up this inquiry, um, um, which has given us the truth um, um, which has been long, long covered up, and, and we can then proceed to what has to be done with your assistance as partners. Thank you. Gracias, Comisionada Margaret. La palabra a la Comisionada Antonia como relatora para... La relatoría de los pueblos eh, indígenas, ¿sí? memoria, verdad y justicia. Um, um, well, first of all, um, thank you very much for, for your presence here today. I think this is a very important um, hearing, and um, thank you very much 
for being here. I would first of all think, I think it's very important first of all to, to thank the, the state and to salute the initiative of doing the national inquiry. I think it is very important. It's better late than never. And I think, it, I hope other countries um, would have an initiative of this one. I mean, uh, the situation of indigenous people in other countries is is um, as serious as the one you have in Canada, but not all the countries have done what Canada has done. So first of all, I think one must recognize the initiative. So first of all, salute that. Also salute the elimination of the sex discrimination from the Indian Act, again, better late than never. <laughs> and the other initiatives that you mentioned, and then, um, as, a, as a reporter of indigenous people and also as mem uh, memory, truth and justice, um, I think it is very important you addressed a few issues and I just want to emphasize on the issues. First of all, the, the plan of action. Um, I think it is very important that plan of action must be done with um, a gender perspective and also from the, the indigenous people's perspective and in that sense it must be with prior consultation. I know Canada has not ratified the, the, the um, convention of the OIT, of the, sorry, Spanglish, but you know, 169. <laughs> Um, but you do have your own, you know, your own um, 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 laws about prior consultation, and I think the plan of action must be done with the participation of the indigenous people. It's very important from that sense, and must be culturally, culturally <coughs> adequate regarding your 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 perspective. And I think it is very important that that plan of action must have a wide discussion among First Nations, first of all. And secondly, I think it is very important you do do a plan of transition, transitional justice, you mentioned it, and that plan must have um, a chapter regarding truth, and when I talk about truth, I mean also justice. Um, you mentioned that the, the, the violence and the genocide is not only from the past, it is happening today. So I assume that the perpetrators are alive today, so those people must be taken to justice. Those people must be trialed, those people must be sanctioned. And I think it is very important that this transitional justice plan must focus also not only on the past and on symbolic justice, but also on um, criminal justice. And there must be a transitional justice plan. Um, there are a lot of experience in Latin America and also in, in Africa and other countries that the Commission can help Canada to look at best practices and do a plan. We have a lot of work. We have done a lot of work in other countries and we can help with um, technical assistance to do a plan on transitional justice so that we can look at truth and justice. We can look at reparations. You talked about reparations and also, which is very important, um, I, I don't know exactly the word in English, but garantías de no repetición. Um, no, non-reputation, which is very important, and also very, very important is memory, which is related to no repetition, no, no, but we have to respect the memory of the victims, and the country has to remember what has happened. When a country has committed genocide, the country must remember what happened, and memory is very, very important. So this plan also has to focus on how we're going to, to um, symbolize the memory and um, honor the memory of the victims also. Um, so also there must be actions regarding the memory of the victims so the country doesn't forget its past and in that sense doesn't do these things in the future. I think also um, this plan of transitional justice must work on the institutions. I understand if we're talking about that this is happening also today, you have a problem with public agents, not only the police, I assume, the judges and you know the people that work on public institutions. There must be capacity building, there must be human rights training, etc., etc. So, well, the plan is enormous <laughs> from what I see. So, um, what I want to say um, is that uh, I'm sure that the Commission can work together with the government 
and with the First Nations and civil society in public assistance. And in that sense, um, I am sure that Flavia, as a reporter of Canada, um, is more than willing to give all the, the technical assistance. And um, of course, you, you asked for the, a working visit. I think that's the first step. So from my report, reporter, I don't know French, I hate it, so. <laughs> I always have a problem with the, with the name of the reporter. Um, yes, but um, I just want to put um, uh, the reporter of truth, justice, and memory, and the indigenous people's reporter um, at your disposition on anything you need, best practices, and any technical assistance you need. Thank you very much. Gracias, Antonia. La comisionada Flavia, como relatora de país. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd start uh, expressing deep gratitude to civil society representatives as well as the state representatives. Um, I, I do endorse <clears throat> the vision of my colleagues that this is a very historical and important moment, a constructive and transparent dialogue, and we will move forward to the implementation phase of the recommendations of the, the report. And a second word, recognizing from the Commission the extraordinary work of the Inquire Commission and the report, and the, as well, and the uh, recognition by the State of Canada. This is, I think, we have to recognize that the State uh, had the openness to say, yes, we accept all the recommendations and the conclusion that a genocide happened. So uh, here is uh, uh, really a vote of recognition and gratitude. Um, the commission, uh, I, again, I would emphasize that our commitment, our engagement, our, um, that we are absolutely enthusiastic about coping with the state, with the civil society, uh, in a cooperative way, technical assistance, uh, in order to provide inter-American standards. We have all the standards, we have a legacy concerning reparations, transitional justice, protection of groups and persons who suffer historical discrimination patterns. And um, so I, I'd like to raise three Question three points of concern. The first has to do with the inclusion of indigenous voices, women voices, girls, LGBTI plus voices uh, in the process. I think this is a key point of legitimacy. If those voices are not there, then I think all the achievement will be into risk. Uh, so I think the, the process is as important as the result. So to give voice to, to guarantee the democratic component is a key element. The second is the engagement of all levels of government because the plan should build up and should achieve all geographies. And the third, um, I do consider it's important to adopt and to stress the gender um, perspective as well as the indigenous perspective and LGBTI rights um, perspective as, as well. And, and in this, in this um, subject matter, uh, we, uh, the commission received uh, uh, an information that uh, I, I, I was really shocked to know that in 2017, the homicide rates against indigenous women were six times six time higher than the non-indigenous women, six times higher. So my question is uh, concerning violence, discrimination, intolerance. Genocide means intolerance and the destruction of the other because of the different component of race, ethnicity, gender, whatever. Um, so I, I would... Uh, I'm interested in knowing the measures, the urgent measures taken by the state to prevent, um, to eradicate, to change cultural patterns. 
um, in terms of equality and non-discrimination. And, and also, I was wondering what would be the homicides rates uh, right now, 2019, if it continues like this, how to really to change this pattern. I think it's an urgent um, want to change and to, to change this, this pattern. It's not one, two times, it's six times. This is really shocking in my point of view. And so thank you so much for this historical moment. And the commission is with you, all of you. We, are, we want to cope with this um, issue. I think it's a historical achievement, as I mentioned, uh, the inquiry, the, all the process, um, the listening, all the, the witnesses, and the conclusions, the recommendations, and now I think it's very important to foment this national action plan in a very adequate methodological way of inclusion, participation, uh, perspectives, approach, and counting with the Commission, with our support, technical support. Thank you so much. Muchas gracias, Comisionada Flavia. Eh, bueno, yo en mi condición también de relatora para los derechos de niños, niñas y adolescentes, tendría eh, también endoso todos los planteamientos hechos por mis colegas, eh, mi eh, reconocimiento eh, a la sociedad civil por, por su trabajo, por su perseverancia, eh, por su compromiso eh, y, y estar eh, acompañando este proceso que hoy eh, podemos, eh, podemos expresar quizás dos posiciones eh, encontradas. Eh, la satisfacción de poder escuchar al Estado señalando que acepta el informe, reconoce su contenido y se compromete a las actuaciones que sean necesarias para alcanzar en una justicia transicional y transformadora, añadiría yo porque es una situación que requiere de su transformación, de un cambio radical de lo que el propio informe señala y el Estado reconoce. Entonces, eh, también tengo que, esa otra parte de, eh, al conocer una situación tan, tan dura, tan difícil, esta consideración de, de la mujer, de las niñas, no solo como objeto, sino para ser destruidas. Eh, y, y eso es lo que en la esencia el concepto de genocidio se nos, eh, se nos presenta. Pero a mí me llamó mucho la atención que en la presentación de ustedes, de la sociedad civil, se hablaba de cinco factores, que puede, cinco tipos o calificación de genocidio. Me gustaría tener esa, esa precisión para mi propio manejo y conocimiento porque porque realmente implica eh, eh, la profundidad del de concepto mismo. ¿no? Eh, quiero, en el tema de la planificación de las acciones a seguir, creo que es muy importante lo que señalaba la comisionada relatora de país, esto de dar voces a todos los... Eh, intervinientes, afectados y particularmente hago el llamado a dar voz también a las niñas, que las niñas tengan esta oportunidad de participar en ese contenido de ese plan. Las niñas necesitan un empoderamiento 
para la protección de, no solo de sus vidas, sino de la propia continuidad de nuestra humanidad entera. Entonces, me parece que hay que colocar en, el, en la programación de esta participación de todos los actores, la participación de las niñas. Y por último, creo que en, la, en, el, en, en el desarrollo de este plan de acción que hoy ya ustedes, la sociedad civil, tiene muy bien identificado lo que representan los asuntos que hay que atender y que hoy el Estado aquí también nos los ha señalado, cultura, bienestar, salud, seguridad humana, justicia, este reconocimiento de la diversidad eh, y, y la intervención de todos los actores también de parte del Estado, es decir, todas las autoridades y todos los territorios, en todos los territorios, porque esto tiene que tener este sentido de nación, de país, de Estado, y no de un sector en particular. Entonces, mi reconocimiento y mi, y mi compromiso también, como lo han dicho mis colegas, de eh, programar, solicitar formalmente una visita de trabajo, reconocemos la veda, no sé si entienden esa palabra en, en español para traducir, la veda que el periodo electoral le da al Estado para pronunciarse y a las otras y a quienes estén en la contienda para pronunciarse. Pero nosotros, como comisión, haremos nuestra solicitud formal de una visita de, de trabajo con la, el apoyo de eh, todas las relatorías que están en este tema involucradas y que representa también una fortaleza para el trabajo nuestro. Así que eh, muchísimas gracias. Yo espero que el Estado haga esta comunicación, aunque nos quede allí en un pendiente de, de una respuesta. Vamos a darle ahora la palabra a la sociedad civil para cualquiera reflexión que se tenga. No sé si la compañera eh, que envía internet iba, eh, que no pudo hacer uso de la palabra, va a decir algo. Le daríamos la palabra primero a ella, ¿les parece? Para que después entonces ustedes concluyan. Lo someto a la consideración de ustedes. ¿Sí? ¿Están listas allá en...? Bien. ¿Otra persona que no, no pudo hablar? ¿Sí? Como ustedes, como ustedes estimen. J'aimerais prendre la parole, le Canada, Viviane Michel, de Femme Autochtone du Québec. Je peux? Sí, bon. sí. Moi, euh, j'aimerais réagir euh, face à l'intervention du Canada. Euh, je n'entends pas l'inclusion des organisations de femmes euh, qui travaillent avec un lien direct et privilégié avec les familles dans le processus du plan d'action. Et il m'apparaît vraiment important de nous inclure dès le départ à la construction d'une belle collaboration avec la société civile, les organisations des régions, évidemment, mais aussi avec le palier gouvernemental. Donc, je n'ai pas entendu euh, ce genre d'inclusion dans l'intervention du Canada. Deuxièmement, sur la loi sur les Indiens, pour le Québec, la bataille des femmes sur la discrimination n'est pas tout à fait gagnée car l'imposition de la déclaration de paternité nous est encore imposée. Une Québécoise, un, un bel exemple que je peux donner, une Québécoise canadienne qui n'a pas de déclaration de paternité n'a aucun impact. L'enfant n'est Québécois canadien. Pourquoi nous, les femmes autochtones, on nous impose encore cette façon qui est inscrite dans la loi sur les Indiens, encore une fois? Ça, c'est vraiment une belle preuve de discrimination qui est encore existante. Voilà mon intervention. Merci. ¿Pueden continuar ustedes? 
Um, thank you for giving us a couple of extra minutes. I, I just wanted to make two points because I understand that Canada is in an election period. However, Canada has a very powerful constitutional national power. So if we were in a situation of war, for example, we wouldn't Canada wouldn't sit back and say, well, you know, we have to take a time out uh, if there was a terrorist attack. There would be an emergency action plan. Um, it, it's a little uncomfortable for Canada to say, you know, we're in an election, so let's just let the genocide continue. Genocide is genocide, and we would never accept that in another country as Canada. So for us, it's a little hard to always wait while well, it's an election time, or, you know, we have to work on the economy, or now we're negotiating NAFTA with the U.S. There's, there's always a reason not to address genocide. And then my only other... Um, my only other comment is, is thank you for everything that you've said and thank you for, for all of this support. It's We need this external and independent assistance because asking the perpetuator of genocide to come up with a plan on how to end genocide also doesn't sit well with us because many of the perpetuators are the RCMP. They're the ones engaged in human trafficking, the rapes of Indigenous women, uh, prison guards, teachers, social workers, and government officials themselves. So it's not just laws and policies, it's also the state actors. So your intervention here is actually going to help us save lives. So thank you for everything that you have committed to and all of the principles that you've espoused. And uh, I just wanted to thank the Commission for the work what they've helped us with. We, w we wished we were here, you know, 50 years ago, if not longer. But we're here now, and, and we really would like to um, uh, thank you and look forward to the help that you can give us to, to move us forward. So thank you. I would like to thank you very kindly for welcoming us here today. Um, but there's one area that is a concern. Um, as a national leader and the groups of women from all across Turtle Island, um, there was a commemoration fund that had been out. And as a national organization, we represent all of the women across Canada in the territories and provinces, as I have stated. But yet, as a national organization, we hadn't received any funds for the commemoration of our women, our girls, and our missing, which is very dear to my heart because we had many of the families who had gone through the inquiry and they were re-victimized, and yet that truth and trust being there and expecting dollars from a national entity as our National Women Association of Canada still weren't able to receive any dollars from the commemoration, which is very important to us. And that's why it's so important when our women and our girls say, you know, how are you going to commemorate? And when we have no dollars, and that's a big question because we are working on behalf of all of our women, girls, two-spirited, and the LGBTQ uh, community members. So I just wanted to, you know, note that. Um, you know, we work hard and we want to commemorate, but the funds we're not giving on a national level. Um, so let me simply say that, you know, we truly appreciate the opportunity to have this exchange uh, this morning. Very much welcome the uh, ongoing engagement of the, uh, of the Inter-American Human Rights Commission on this, uh, uh, on this matter and many other important matters related to um, uh, Indigenous peoples in the Americas. We've obviously taken careful uh, note of the comments, of the questions, and the offers of technical assistance as well uh, made by the Commission. We've taken good note of the comments made by uh, civil society representatives this morning also. Um, and so we'll be more than happy to provide uh, written uh, comments in response, to, uh, um, in response to the various questions this morning, uh, and um, uh, as we've done in the past, actually. So thank you so much again. Bueno, muchas gracias. Eh, bueno. Okay. Um, for, forgive me for speaking again, but I, I forgot to mention uh, the fact that I will be going to Canada next, next week um, for a, a conference, uh, which I was invited to by Professor um, Bernard Duhem. How do you pronounce the surname? Duhem. 
yes, um, who I know before, we've been on platforms before. And I did intend to make mention of this because one must use every public opportunity to speak uh, about this um, report and what will follow it. Um, so rest assured that I will give a part of my presentation to it. And we look forward to working with you. Bueno, muchísimas gracias a todas las participaciones hechas por, por la sociedad civil, también al Estado, agradeciendo eh, la oportunidad y vamos a dar por terminada la, esta audiencia.